the CCSE Distinguished Seminar for the spring term. I'm uh, very pleased to welcome Dr. Aidan Thompson um, from Sandia National Laboratories in New Mexico. Um, so Aidan received his PhD in chemical engineering and has spent uh, most of his career at Sandia since, um, and is an expert in large scale atomistic simulation of materials and its intersection with high performance computing um, and has been a key developer of the LAMPS um, molecular dynamics software package that many of you know and love, and has also worked in kinetic Monte Carlo and methods for learning interatomic potentials and using them to access um, you know, materials behavior on a very interesting timescales. And uh, it leads a number of interesting projects related to materials in, in, in nuclear applications, the use of machine learning to build interatomic potentials and exascale computing. So we're really pleased to welcome him here today and uh, excited to uh, have this talk about um, uh, an atomistic simulation. So please take it away. Thank you very much, Yosef. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here virtually. I'd like to be there in person uh, near the Charles River, but um, this, is, this is pretty good too. Um, so I'm gonna talk about uh, predictive atomistic simulations of materials using SNAP data-driven potentials. Um, and so, figure out how to use my arrows, there we go. So um, before I get into the details, I just wanted to, uh, since this is a pretty broad audience, I wanted to give a quick uh, uh, explanation for, for why we care about interatomic potentials and, and what they're useful for. Um, so the, the key idea here is that um, we, we like to use a method that's sometimes called molecular dynamics. I prefer to call it atomistic simulation because we're really dealing with atoms in materials rather than molecules, which is perhaps more common in things like biology. Um, and so the, the reason why we want to do this atomistic simulation is because we can, um, we can get at the behavior of materials in a very fundamental way without making any strong assumptions. And in fact, if we use a method called uh, quantum molecular dynamics, which is shown on the left here, um, we can solve approximate versions of the uh, Schrodinger equation at every time step for the electronic structure of the, of the gas or the, or the sea of atoms, um, so, sorry, sea of electrons that, that, that surround the atoms in the particular positions that they're in. That um, electronic structure then gives us the forces on the atoms and then from that, we can advance one time step and repeat that many, many times. And um, the problem is, well, first of all, it's very, very accurate. Um, you know, there's been many, many comparisons between methods like density functional theory and experimental observations. And in many cases, the, the accuracy is as good or better than the accuracy of the experiments themselves. Um, but the problem is, it is very expensive computation. Um, so even with very good algorithms, the best codes out there, the best computer hardware out there, um, there is a, a scaling limitation. Typically, this, the cost is order n cubed, and that means that you can do 100 atoms quite routinely, but 1,000 atoms is almost impossible to do. And so the sweet spot for this method is, is on the order of a couple of hundred atoms, um, and no amount of sort of algorithmic or hardware improvement is really going to change that very much. Um, so you can do a lot of interesting stuff uh, that's shown in that, in that uh, blue rectangle in the lower left of the plot, but it's at these very uh, small length scales and time scales, so on the order of angstroms and femtoseconds, maybe picoseconds. Whereas a lot of the stuff that we're interested in the world around us, devices, uh, natural phenomena, whatever, is occurring on these much, much larger mesoscale and macroscale time scales. And in most cases, um, what we're representing with the quantum methods is not really uh, relevant to what's happening, the, the, the physics that's emerging on these larger length scales. So how do we um, deal with this? Well, of course, we, we make some uh, clever approximations. We throw out all the electrons and replace their effective uh, forces with what we call a classical interatomic potential. And that's described on the, uh, on the right here. My, this, uh, I've got something blocking my screen here. Okay, let me make that go away. Um, so the key thing about uh, uh, a classical molecular dynamics with a, with a classical in, interatomic potential is now we've, we've um, replaced a lot of the complicated physics associated with the quantum electronic structure 
with a potential energy surface that the atoms move on. And that potential energy surface historically has been figured out by clever physics and chemistry understanding of the nature of the interactions between the atoms. So, you know, you might invoke a metallic model or a covalent bonded model or whatever, and then you'd have a few adjustable parameters that you would, you would tweak. Um, it's a wonderful method in terms of computational efficiency. Um, a code like LAMPS now gives you a whole host of different uh, inner atomic potentials you can run, and they're generally uh, very, very uh, efficient and they scale wonderfully. So, so linear and linear scaling in the number of atoms, um, very good parallel efficiency, and so that allows us to do things like shown in the in the image in the lower right there. That's actually a, a shock wave moving through a a large crystal uh, with a with a small void in it, and then there's a lot of energy deposited as the void collapses, and that's very important for understanding things like initiation of detonation. So this simulation is maybe a hundred million atoms, and uh, say so ten years ago it was somewhat hard to do that. Today it's it's pretty routine uh, because of the fact that these methods are so well adapted to the hardware and the algorithms that are available to us. But of course. Everything is still predicated on the accuracy of the inner atomic potentials that's used. And so what we find when we make detailed comparisons with the quantum methods that there's, there's a lot of problems. Um, and it, so really the focus of the work that I've been doing over the last 10 years is, is to try to have the best of both worlds. So um, retain the linear scaling and the nice parallel algorithms that work well on the big hardware, but um, also retain the accuracy of the quantum methods. And of course, we're using machine learning to do that. So um, the particular approach that we've developed is called SNAP, which stands for Spectral Neighbor Analysis Potentials. We've now got a, an open source uh, training software on GitHub called FitSnap. And um, conceptually, the, the process is, is fairly simple. Um, on the upper left here, we've got um, an energy model for each atom in a configuration of atoms. That energy model depends on these mysterious uh, vectors B that are essentially like fingerprints. Got a little cartoon of a fingerprint over here. And these, these fingerprints characterize the local neighborhood of that atom. And so it makes sense that the energy of that atom should depend on uh, only the positions of, of the nearby neighbors. And that's sort of the fundamental idea behind SNAP and also a lot of other machine learning potentials is this idea of locality. So once we have that, uh, we then combine that with a whole load of training data. So uh, this shows a whole lot of thumbnails of different snapshots. Um, and of course, there's a lot of uh, details about what exactly those snapshots represent, but typically it's, it's energies, forces, and stress tensors for particular configurations that are generated using uh, a quantum method like, like density functional theory. And um, with those two things together, we can do a forward pass and we can figure out what these unknown linear coefficients, the betas are. Um, and that's, that's something that might only take you, say, half an hour to do on a, on a big computer. But there's a lot more to it because uh, there are, there are um, hyperparameters that are uh, controlling the overall form of the potential as well. And those hyperparameters have a highly nonlinear effect on, on the model. Uh, those are things like the weights that uh, we use to, to uh, prioritize different uh, training data, so different types of configurations also the relative weight of say energies versus forces and stress tensors. But there's also kind of more physical parameters like what's the size of the neighborhood that we want to use um, in, our, in our kind of uh, short sighted uh, physics model. And there's a lot of other uh, sort of things like that that have to be tuned. And you can do this by hand using sort of um, clever uh, human intelligence but you can also just throw a genetic algorithm at it. And that's kind of the approach that we now favor. Um, and oftentimes we let the GA grind away for weeks, um, searching out uh, good hyperparameters. And we evaluate them based on uh, objective functions that are representative of the particular application that we're interested in. So we're always searching for things that are doing well for the particular science application that we're interested in. And in this way, uh, we can, in a fairly uh, automated way generate uh, very high accuracy potentials that are that are tailored to specific science applications. So a little bit more about the um, the mathematics behind uh, SNAP. So those those B vectors that are referred to are these uh, 
things called bispectrum components, and they're actually triple products of um, basis functions. Uh, so we've got uh, one u times another u times another u. The thing in the middle is a Klebsch-Gordon coefficient. Um, and the reason why this um, is there is because we're actually um, making sure that whatever energy model we end up with satisfies important physical symmetries that are essential. So rotation invariance, translation invariance, and also permutation of neighbor atoms of the same element. Um, and so the, the Klebsch-Gordon coefficients actually give us that rotational invariance. Um, and there's some other nice properties of, of these bispectrum components. They're typically, I mean, in, in general, they're, they're four body interactions. So they depend on the positions of four atoms at a time, uh, which makes them relatively complex. Uh, a lot of um, interatomic potentials are built up using two body and three body interactions. And so, so this gives us uh, a lot more descriptive power. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about descriptors later in the talk. So the very first thing that we did with this um, approach when we first started uh, working with it was try it out uh, on a particular problem in the, beha the mechanical behavior or the plastic response of tantalum metal. So it's a, it's a BCC metal and it tends to um, deform plastically by the migration of screw dislocations through the crystal. And um, so every time a screw dislocation moves one lattice spacing, that then a lot, uh, provides a little bit of uh, shear strain. So the, the energy barrier for moving one of those screw dislocations is a very important property of uh, any BCC solid. Um, and so what I'm showing here in this graph is actually what I'll call a post diction rather than a prediction because um, we did not have the DFT results for the pyrals barrier. This is the energy barrier for moving the screw dislocation. That DFT result is shown by the blue line. We, we did not have that when we uh, initially trained the uh, SNAP potential. We, we had uh, simpler st structural properties that were related to, to this pyrals barrier, um, but this calculation was actually rather expensive to do. And so initially we didn't have it. And the resultant SNAP potential that we got matched up with that very well. And actually we got a whole family of SNAP potentials that were all sort of similar um, in accuracy and they all behaved similarly to this. So somehow the nature of the training data that we generated was giving us this nice result. In contrast to that, there were two previous potentials, an EAM potential and an ADP potential that were quite widely used um, in uh, mechanical simulations of, of uh, BCC tantalum. And this, this paper that was uh, subsequently published by Stephen Foyles and others um, showed that these potentials were completely wrong uh, in terms of how they represent the pyrals barrier um, relative to DFT. Not only were, were they, was the pyrals barrier, pyrals barrier the wrong uh, magnitude, but there was actually a metastable uh, state in the middle in both of these potentials, which, which gave qualitatively the wrong plastic response. Um, whereas the DFT has, a, has an energy maximum in, in the middle as does the SNAP potential. So that was a really nice result um, with a very small amount of training data should be added. So 363 configurations. So over the intervening years, we've extended this approach uh, to a lot of other materials. And I'm just gonna kind of go through a compendium here of them. But what you'll notice is that as time goes on, the size of the training data sets that we're using and not, and not just us, but also other people is growing uh, by orders of magnitude. Um, and we most recently started working with a, a high entropy training data set for tungsten that uh, actually contains 330,000 uh, configurations, all of which we've been able to uh, run DFT calculations for. So this shows you actually that the, the generation of training data using DFT for small configurations is actually very cheap because it's basically embarrassing parallel. And you can farm it out to a large commodity computing cluster and it might you know, take you a few weeks or whatever, but you, you, can, you can generate vast amounts of training data, which of course makes it then very amenable to all kinds of machine learning approaches. Um, so now I'm gonna talk briefly about a couple of applications uh, that we've been working on recently. The first of these is in uh, fusion energy, which um, has become sort of an important uh, application area for us, uh, thanks to collaboration with people, uh, not just at Sandia, on the experimental side, but also at Los Alamos and at the University of Tennessee in, in Knoxville. Um, and so the main target for um, fusion energy research 
in materials science is trying to figure out how to uh, build wall materials for these tokamak containers that can withstand the very hostile environment of the burning plasma. So the image here is from the, uh, the JET Joint European Taurus, uh, which currently exists, and it's sort of a smaller scale version of a much larger um, tokamak that's being built at the ETER facility in France. And the, the goal really is to figure out how to, con how to design these materials and how to control the conditions in the, in the tokamak so that they don't um, completely get destroyed in a couple of seconds by the, by the plasma. And so the way that the plasma interacts with the material is very complex. Um, it's sort of represented in cartoon form on the lower left there. There's many, many different processes occurring, but essentially a lot of what's happening is you've got helium ions, hydrogen ions that are uh, bombarding the surface. They're, they're either reacting right at the surface or they're being implanted deeper into the material. Not only that, but you can get um, metal solid structure, solid material being removed from one part of the, of the container vessel and then being uh, deposited in another part. And a particular version of that is um, beryllium being removed from most of the first wall material and then being sort of preferentially deposited in the diverter, which is sort of like the exhaust system for the, for the tokamak. And the diverter material is made of tungsten and it has a very high uh, particle flux compared to the rest of the reactor. And so beryllium deposition on the tungsten diverter is an important uh, aspect of the material's behavior. So we um, decided to go after this with our SNAP uh, method because there wasn't really a good potential, uh, say going back three or four years ago, there were, there were no good potentials for representing both tungsten and beryllium together. Uh, we designed a training data set that contained a lot of normal things like elastically deformed uh, crystals and things like that. But we also made sure to include a lot of these somewhat exotic bimetallic structures uh, that are known to uh, be formed by uh, different compositions of tungsten and beryllium together. Um, <clears throat> once we had done that and we went through this, this training process that I described earlier, we ended up with a potential that performed quite well for a wide variety of different properties. In, in particular, um, the representation of beryllium defects within the tungsten matrix. And so the first column here shows, shows formation energies for different beryllium defects uh, calculated using DFT. The second column shows SNAP. Third column shows a previously developed uh, bond order potential, which is sort of what I might call state of the art for physics inspired potentials. And so the, the bond order potential is uh, very, very poor for these, for these properties. The, the SNAP potential across the board um, does quite well. There's still a few things that we're not too happy about, like this, this dumbbell formation energy is about an electron volt too low. Uh, the octahedral uh, formation energy is about two electron volts too high. And so there's, there's a few things that we would still like to fix with this, but um, it's actually turned out to be quite good for doing uh, some basic scientific studies of the, uh, the, the processes. And so an example of that is shown here. These are some large scale MD simulations that we've been doing looking at the effect of uh, beryllium deposition on tungsten and then how it affects helium, uh, uh, helium re retention within the material. Uh, and so we've looked at three different scenarios, pure crystalline tungsten, then also um, an amorphous uh, layer of uh, tungsten beryllium that's formed when we um, energetically deposit beryllium on the surface. And then finally, we built sort of a uh, nice, uh, well-ordered, uh, tungsten BE2 bimetallic structures. And so what we find then when we subsequently take these structures and bombard them with helium atoms is that we get a, quite a different response um, compared to pure tungsten. So this is what we see, and this is, has been seen in, in, with simpler potentials as well, is that the helium can actually penetrate quite deep into the surface and it forms relatively large um, clusters, which you can think of as helium bubbles that are starting to form with, within the tungsten matrix. But as soon as we add uh, this either amorphous beryllium layer or a bimetallic beryllium structure, we find that most of the helium is unable to penetrate uh, deep within the surface and stays closer, uh, close to the surface and does not form uh, large bubbles deep within the surface. And we think this could be a, a, 
a beneficial property of the deposition of helium of, of beryllium within the uh, ITER reactor. And there's, this is probably going to lead to more experimental studies to try to uh, verify this result. Okay, so another um, nice uh, vignette uh, on uh, how we're using SNAP for another complex material, and that's indium phosphide, which is um, an important semiconductor. Um, it's also important to know how it responds to um, radiation damage. So for example, what happens when atoms get hit by neutrons? Um, how does that affect the, the, the electronic properties of the material? And so key to that is being able to predict the uh, defect formation energies of the point defects in this material. Um, previously with, with regular SNAP, we had found that we were not doing a good job predicting these defect formation energies. We finally hit on a, a sort of a, a nice generalization of SNAP where we replace the, um, the neighbor density that I described previously with a neighbor with a, with a partial neighbor density where we're looking at um, densities of each element in separation in the neighborhood of one atom. Um, because now we've got these chemically labeled densities, which then give us these chemically labeled uh, basis functions, when we combine them to get bispectrum components, we can now have three different chemical labels on the three different basis functions. So that means that uh, the bispectrum components themselves can carry three different chemical labels. That gives us basically an order n cubed in the increase in the number of descriptors, where n is now the number of elements. The force calculation cost does go up a bit. Um, it's, it's order n squared in the number of um, chemical elements, but um, it's worth it because it gives us much greater uh, kind of richness in the chemical detail, which is shown in this kind of color chart here versus the original SNAP where everything is lumped together, where we don't have that much discrimination between different uh, chemical environments where the only change is um, changing the chemical identities of the nearby atoms. So that's the theory uh, the practice is, yes, that it does work quite well. This plot here shows that we're getting um, about an order of magnitude improvement in the average errors in our training data set when we go from regular SNAP to what we call ChemSnap. And more importantly, when we look at defect formation energies, um, the striped lines are the uh, values obtained from DFT. The blue is uh, the ChemSnap result which in all cases uh, closely matches the DFT. And then the green and the, and the red were uh, our previous regular SNAP model. And then also another indium phosphide potential that's physics inspired by Bernicio and coworkers. So we've now got a really good model for the defect formation uh, process in, in uh, indium phosphide. And we're now going on to use that in radiation damage studies. So um, now I wanna kind of take a couple of steps um, out and look at this, look at the wider ecosystem of machine learning in atomic potentials, instead of just focusing on SNAP. Um, and uh, I think this is interesting for a couple of reasons. One is because, you know, what SNAP is doing is similar in many ways uh, to what a lot of other people are doing around the world in this space, but there's, but there's some interesting differences as well. And so we can all learn from each other by kind of seeing um, which parts of our stuff uh, works well and, and which uh, things maybe other people seem to be having better success with. And so it's nice to kind of try to characterize uh, the different kinds of machine learning potentials that people have developed. And there's three different um, dimensions, I think, that are important to look at. Uh, the first of these is the energy model or the regression method that's used. So everything I've described to you so far with SNAP has been using linear regression, but there are lots of other interesting sort of um, energy models that you can use. And the most notable ones, I think, might be a kernel ridge regression, Gaussian process, and of course, neural networks. And th there's lots of kind of strengths and weaknesses and pros and cons of using all of these. But um, I think uh, there isn't that much innovation here. In other words, a lot, a lot of what's being used is the same methods that are being used in many other fields of, of uh, science and technology and data science. Um, so I'm not going to kind of get into the argument about wh which of these is better and, and so on. Um, similarly for data, th there's, there's some basic things that people understand that it's of course good to train on DFT energies, but it's also very useful to use forces. And then some people may like to use stress tensors in certain cases, and that's uh, not, not widespread, I would say. Um, 
But of course, where it gets interesting is what types of structures should you use? And one thing that people agree on is that if you really want to have a robust um, potential that works well in, in, in complicated situations, the most important thing is to have diversity in the training data. So if you're just doing a few things, um, that's probably not going to be sufficient. Um, but you know how exactly to achieve that diversity is, is of course, um, a wide open problem. And also, to what extent should that diversity be tailored towards um, your particular science application? So there's a lot of really interesting ideas here around um, active learning, uh, uncertainty quantification, and uh, things like that, that I would say we uh, at Sandia are just scratching the surface on this. Um, I think other people have perhaps moved further along, but um, we've now teamed up with uh, people at Sandia, California, uh, Habib Najim and Kachik Sargassian, and we're hoping to kind of really improve our ability to optimize the design of, of uh, training data in a, in a way that uses a lot of uh, data science methods. But what I really like to focus on are the descriptors, and um, because this is kind of the wild west of machine learning potentials. Um, there isn't really anything from other fields of science and technology that we can draw on um, to figure out what makes good descriptors. A lot of the stuff that people have developed over the last 10 years for descriptors um, within this community has been sort of unique to this community. It's, it, so there's been a huge amount of creativity and innovation and um, kind of trying to figure out the things that really matter. Um, and everybody now agrees that uh, what really matters are these um, physical symmetries, rotation, translation, permutation invariance. Also, of course, um, having forces that are also respecting those physical symmetries, which I call here equivariant forces. Um, smoothness uh, is a really important property that people don't always uh, pay enough attention to. Um, there's lots of potentials out there that have discontinuities that are completely um, unusable as a result. And even things like neural networks can create a lot of problems with, um, with sort of very, very high uh, very large forces, let's say, due to very uh, short wavelength um, var variation that uh, is, makes them unsuitable and unphysical, I would say. Uh, and then there's something called extensibility, which basically means that your energy model should respect known um, physical behavior. Like if you double the size of your system without changing anything else, then your energy should double. So, but within those constraints, then there's a huge number of possibilities that people have explored. Uh, as I mentioned, the simpler methods are two-body and three-body uh, descriptors, so they depend on radial distance and, and angles. Um, but then there's lots of uh, interesting things that you can do beyond that. The deep pot method developed at Princeton University, um, Lin Feng Zhang, Wainan E, and uh, uh, Roberto Carr, is, is a very interesting and unique uh, way of, of doing descriptors. The CHIMES method at Lawrence Livermore using Chebyshev polynomials. There's a lot of interesting graph-based methods, but there's a lot of um, descriptors that are in this class that I call basis expansions. And one of the nice things about these is they have a lot of physics that kind of backs them up, I will say. Um, and also they've been found to all belong to this broader family that I'm gonna mention later called the atomic cluster expansion. And so my feeling is that the atomic cluster expansion may actually be the optimal um, way to do descriptors in this application. Um, so uh, I'm gonna keep an eye on the clock here, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, comparing machine learning potentials. So there's a lot of people working in this, in this area and they typically um, don't compare much to each other because it's actually a lot of work to kind of figure out and we produce what somebody else is doing. So they typically just try to keep doing what they're doing better and better. But a notable exception is a paper that was published in 2020 by uh, Xiu Ping Ong uh, that I was a co-author on and so were uh, several other leading practitioners of machine learning potentials. Um, but we didn't really uh, contribute much to the, the, the work in the paper except for giving advice and making our software available to the group at UCSD. They generated their own training data, um, and then they applied uh, all of our methods to uh, try to see which of them 
gave the best test errors, okay? And of course, when you look at test errors, it's important to also look at computational cost. And so, so we've got this sort of two-dimensional way of looking at these families of potentials. There's a Pareto front that you can see starts to emerge where everybody would like to push closer and closer down and to the left, but uh, that's hard to do. Uh, on this particular study, the one that did the best was the moment tensor potential developed by Alexander Shapeyev at Skoltech in Moscow, Russia. Um, our quadratic snap, I'm happy to say, uh, did very well in this kind of sweet spot area where you're getting a good balance between computational cost and accuracy. Um, and it's interesting that both of these are linear regression models, um, as is the atomic cluster expansion method that I'll talk about later, whereas a Gaussian process and neural network um, didn't do so well on this particular test. Another nice thing that came out of this was the measurement of computational cost allowed us to update a plot that Steve Plimpton and I developed uh, in the context of lamps where we benchmarked a large number of inner atomic potentials in lamps using the same hardware. So we're looking at uh, computational cost in seconds per atom per time step. And we plotted this data as a function of when each potential was published. And for a, quite a while, it looked like we were kind of undergoing this inverse Moore's law behavior where potentials were just getting more and more expensive the time, as time goes on. Um, so remember that we're running on the same hardware. So this is like inflation adjust, adjusted uh, cost of, of potentials. Um, but these blue dots are the machine learning potentials that I'm showing on the left. And they actually seem to have broken the trend uh, because they're actually in general cheaper than the most expensive physics inspired potential, which is a really nice result. Um, so now I, I don't, I'm running out of time, so I, I don't think I can spend too much time talking about this, but I just wanted to mention that um, the atomic cluster expansion is a very nice way of doing um, descriptors. And there is a paper that's currently under review uh, that actually uh, compares for, for copper, compares how well um, ACE does on the benchmark that I mentioned on the previous slide. And so this, this uh, plot, which I apologize for the poor quality is taken from a draft of the paper, uh, shows that uh, across the board, um, ACE beats the moment tensor potential Pareto front, which in turn uh, beats uh, the other ones that I mentioned earlier. And so it looks like ACE has kind of, um, has uh, raised the bar in terms of uh, accuracy cost uh, trade-off which is quite important. Okay, so now I've just got a few more minutes left. I'm gonna talk a, a little bit more about something that for me is one of the most enjoyable aspects of this work. And that is the software that's used to um, enable all of these wonderful uh, models. And um, of course I've been working on the SNAP software uh, for about 10 years now in LAMPS and um, we've made lots of improvements to that, but um, the bigger picture is, is quite complicated. So we've got a lot of innovation going on, particularly in the area of descriptors. And of course, descriptors are where most of the computational cost uh, sits with these ML potentials when you're running a LAMP simulation. And so we've got a rapidly no growing number of these uh, things. And they're all using their own kind of custom approaches to calculate descriptors. They're also using their own special um, energy models like they might have something coded up native in LAMPS or they might be using PyTorch or TensorFlow or scikit-learn or something else. And um, they also uh, have a problem that you tend to, if you want to adopt one of these um, methods that's, that may be implemented in LAMPS, you kind of have to use the descriptor and the model together. You don't get to pick and choose. You don't get to mix and match different descriptors with different models. Um, and also, of course, it's hard to understand how other people's code works, even at a kind of superficial level. And this slows down innovation. It's harder for, even if it's open source, it's harder for other people to, to adapt it to their purposes. Uh, and then, of course, there's lots of code maintenance issues and uh, you know, incomplete compatibility with LAMPS and so on. So I started to think about maybe if there was a better way to do this in general. And so the answer is now, there, the answer is yes, I think. Um, and it's called uh, the MLIAP package in LAMPS that I, I wrote the first uh, version of this, but now a lot of other people have started contributing to it. And so the key idea is to um, separate out three things. First of all, the complexity of LAMPS itself, which most people 
don't want to deal with if they can avoid it. The second thing is the complexity of the descriptors, which is, as I mentioned, is where a lot of the innovation is occurring. And then the third thing is the complexity of the energy models, which oftentimes are, are like standard um, libraries like uh, PyTorch that, again, nobody should really have to deal with this. Um, they should just treat it as a black box. And so the way that I was able to separate these things out is by creating a data class that is, is just focused on the needs of interfacing these descriptors, these models, and LAMPS itself. And this turned out to be not that hard to do, actually. Um, and we've now got it working for all of the different um, variants of SNAP. And it allows mixing and matching of different models and different descriptors. Um, so I let's see if I want to talk about all of this. Well, first of all, there is a URL there, so you can actually take a look at that, and it'll it'll tell you more. Um, it's public in Lamps, um, and it it I, I key point here is that even though we've implemented all of the SNAP variants in, in this new form, the, the uh, computation overhead is, is negligible. So basically the speed of the SNAP potentials is the same as it was before because most of the cost is in the descriptors. Uh, the thing on the right explains that you can use this both for running uh, an MD simulation where you just calculate the forces, but you can also use it to actually train a model and um, because for that you need to know the, the derivatives of the forces with respect to model parameters. And that's a little bit more complicated, but I've implemented two different ways of doing that. And there's pros and cons to doing both of those. Um, so one uh, new innovation that was uh, a collaboration between myself, Nick Lobbers at Los Alamos and a few other people was to make PyTorch an energy model through this MLIP interface. And uh, this is now done and it's public in LAMPS. And the trick to making this work is uh, to use something called Cython, which provides an interface between the C++ code and some custom um, Python code that, that Nick Lubbers wrote. And now that that custom code is done uh, and it's, it's kind of connected to the rest of LAMPS via Cython, now you can, any, anybody can come along and they can add their own um, arbitrary kind of Python library so in this case, we've got something called MLIP PyTorch, which is just a Python interface to PyTorch itself. And so uh, now we can run um, and train SNAP potentials that use a neural network instead of linear regression, which is really nice. And uh, we're still kind of playing around with this. We haven't actually applied it to any real applications yet, but we're hoping to do that soon. Um, okay, and this is way too much information, but it just shows that you can now and run a SNAP model in four different ways in LAMPS and get exactly the same result and almost exactly the same performance, no matter which of these four ways you do it. And I won't attempt to describe these four ways right now. Um, but what I would like to mention, and this is the final slide on this, is um, that we've got a lot more people contributing to this, in particular, uh, Shang Zhu and his uh, colleagues at UNLV have implemented the SO3 descriptors, which are the uh, analogs of the bispectrum, uh, but the bispectrum is SO4. In other words, it's based on a four dimensional sphere. And these are the somewhat more um, ordinary physics based uh, SO3 descriptors. They have also implemented a native neural network energy model. So that's coded up in C++ within the MLIP package. I'm working with John Belloff at um, Lawrence Livermore to implement a, a repulsive Steinhardt W six squared parameter. So people who know what the Steinhardt parameters are in material science know what those are. And the key is you can use this to suppress icosahedral order as it emerges from a melt. And instead you favor um, lower, uh, sorry, higher symmetry uh, crystal motifs like FCC and BCC crystals. And this is very important for uh, studying nucleation of um, solids from liquids. Finally, uh, working with Danny Perez at Los Alamos to implement something called entropy maximization as a force in uh, lamps. So in this case, we're actually using the entropy of in the snap descriptor space of different configurations to drive the uh, simulation towards configurations that have not been represented yet. So in other words, this is a way to enhance diversity in a, in a, a training data set. 
Um, and finally, I just want to say something about computational performance, um, because this has been very, very interesting for me. And I think it also suggests that there's a lot more opportunities in the area of machine learning potentials to actually improve uh, performance by orders of magnitude over what uh, we're currently seeing, which of course is of great interest in terms of making this more widely, uh, making these methods more widely used because a lot of people still want to use say embedded atom method just because it's so damn fast and, and they don't necessarily worry as much as they should about accuracy. So if we can really boost the performance of these methods, I think it'll make a huge difference. Um, and so in the case of um, SNAP, we've definitely improved CPU performance uh, in various ways over the years. But what's interesting is the last couple of years, we focused on GPU performance. And we started out with what we thought was a pretty good Cocos-based implementation uh, running on GPUs. That's the, uh, the first dot there, way down at the bottom. This was using Cocos and um, people who developed it had told me that there was no way anybody was going to improve on it for uh, reasons related to memory access patterns and stuff like that. But it turns out through a highly collaborative effort involving people at uh, Los Alamos and also NERSC, um, we, we sort of tried out a lot of different things and did a lot of very aggressive experimentation. And over the course of several years, we've been able to boost the performance on the V100 by 50x, which is incredible. And uh, this is making a, a big difference now in our production simulations when we're running on uh, machines like Summit, uh, where we do a lot of our fusion energy um, applications. And it also creates an interesting kind of relationship with the uh, cheaper potentials that I mentioned earlier, like the EAM method that is, is actually pretty common for um, fusion energy material simulations. Because um, while in raw cost, uh, the cost of SNAP versus EAM is one, two, three orders of magnitude. That's a thousand X difference in speed. And that's sort of um, something not to be um, taken lightly. But if we throw for a fixed size problems, four million atoms in this case, this is real, um, real uh, production simulation data. You take that four million atom simulation on one node of summit, that's six GPUs. And then we start adding nodes to it. Our, our, our computation speed is going up linearly at first. And then of course, at a certain point, then things do start to flatten out. And so the sweet spot is around about here where we've got um, about 30,000 atoms per node, um, about 5,000 atoms on each GPU. Um, at that point, we're getting about four nanoseconds per day in our production simulations by, by using a relatively large number of, of uh, nodes and and a relatively small number of, of atoms per node. If you try the same trick with embedded atom copper, it doesn't work. Um, the four million atoms runs pretty good on uh, one node, but if you go to uh, more nodes, you really don't get much speed up at all. And so it's not worth actually going to more nodes. You kind of have to run those four million atoms on one node. And so when you view it in those terms, that thousand X difference in cost is now um, only about 20 X. Um, because of the fact that these machine learning potentials are much more amenable to the, the on-node parallelism and the, and the between-node parallelism that uh, large supercomputers provide. Um, going the wrong direction. And with that, I have made it to my conclusions. Uh, I'm still going to try to leave a little bit of time for questions. Um, so what I really want to say is that I think what we're looking at is, is a broad transition in the role of um, uh, machine learning potentials. Um, and and it's, it, it's affecting how people do large scale atomistic materials. So instead of doing things that are nice qualitative descriptions of what a material might be doing, um, we are now much more getting towards quantitative predictions of what materials actually are doing in very specific cases. Um, the current areas of research for us are combining SNAP with, with neural networks and looking at better descriptors, including the atomic cluster expansion, trying to make this work well for, for much more complex systems that have many elements in play and also have a lot of chemistry going on. Um, eventually, what we really want is to be able to provide a, a general audience, like, like LAMPS currently has a, a wide um, community of users, most of whom are not experts in molecular dynamics, We'd like to be able to do the same thing for machine learning potentials where people can actually develop 
their own machine learning potentials for their application without really knowing much about how it all works. Um, and so in order to make this happen, there are some challenges and robustness is a big one. Um, and there's many aspects to that, but essentially when you're running molecular dynamics, even a single bad force prediction can just ruin a calculation. Um, and that's a big reason why people like these low accuracy, rather simple potentials, because even if they're not very accurate, they also do not misbehave. Uh, and so trying to eliminate bad behavior is, is a key thing that we need to focus on with these more complicated potentials. Um, developing kind of uh, on the fly methods for, for assessing accuracy so we can actually detect problems and then go back and fix them uh, is, is very important. And the collaboration with uh, folks at Sandia California is, is a big part of that. Um, and similarly, active learning where when we find problems with particular configurations and maybe realize that they're not represented in the training data, we can go back and add them, refit the model and then repeat. And um, so I've got a little a set of thumbnails at the bottom showing where this is making a difference in the work that we're directly involved with. Fusion energy is a big part of that and um, developing uh, high entropy alloys for refractory materials is very important. Radiation damage in semiconductors. And um, a very recent one is uh, looking at uh, phase change kinetics, um, which is a very, very difficult problem. Um, and it's really hard to get good experimental data or I say continuum models that are any good. And so I think atomistic simulation is going to play a big role in that. And with that, um, I'd like to just thank the people on this slide uh, for all of the contributions that they've made directly to the work that I've shown in this talk. And I'd like to thank the funding agencies and take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Aidan. Thanks for the really nice talk. Um, let's open up the floor to questions. And um, I guess we're doing raised hands. I see a hand from Ju. Yeah, uh, thanks, Adam. That's a really a great talk. And mm -hmm. I wish more of my group can be here. So I'd actually like to request a recording of this to show to the people who couldn't make it. So you mentioned the optimization of the hyperparameters yes. so to reach uh, this kind of Pareto front. And one uh, like issue is, is you know, in... in um, in MD, we always have a, like a cutoff. So, what what you know is the status with respect to you know, the number of neighbors you you include in the uh, in the descriptors? Well, it's it's uh, it's highly problem dependent because um, it really depends on what's going on in the electronic structure in the material, um, and so we, for a variety of reasons, we've the pot potentials we've developed so far, we've tended to try to keep the number of neighbors low and maybe too low in some cases. Um, and that of course, part is driven by computational efficiency. Um, but there's also some interesting things that happen where uh, if you actually increase the, we, we actually try to optimize the, the cutoff and we find that as you go to larger and larger cutoffs, the, the accuracy in some cases actually gets worse. Um, and, and that's superficial, a little bit surprising but it's essentially, I think, a manifestation of the fact that if you include far neighbors in your descriptors and they're not actually affecting the energy of that atom, then those, those signals that you're picking up are essentially noise. And so, you, so now you're basically increasing the noise um, and the underlying signal is fixed. Um, so there is a, there is a, there does appear to be an optimal number of neighbors now. <coughs> Um, with things like atomic cluster expansion, it's possible that that might shift a little bit. I, I'd have to think about that some more. And I think that's something that definitely is an area of active research. Um, so yeah, I, think, I think maybe it also has to do with the DFT uh, training data, because you, I mean, we, we tend to use very small size DFT to, to train yep. them. Correct. I think if, you, if one can sort of judiciously choose the size of the DFT, I mean, maybe once in a time, you know, have a pretty big size uh, DFT data that could help. Yeah, and I think also like if you get into um, systems where you have real long range effects, like ionicity, um, charge transfer, and maybe sort of molecular interactions that go along, you know, a polymer backbone, th things like that. Um, 
which we've avoided uh, so far for exactly that reason, um, are going to be particularly challenging. And uh, we're, we're starting to think more about doing things like polymer chemistry, maybe uh, molecular biophysics, stuff like that. That's, and, and of course, water is a big one. <laughs> uh, we, we've also stayed away from water. Um, but uh, I, I've noticed, you know, the group at Princeton University seems to have had some success with a, a water uh, potential using their approach. Uh, Jörg Baylor has built some nice water models. So uh, these things are definitely treatable, but they do require more care. Thank you. I think uh, next hand is from Alan. I think um, Vaughn was first, so I don't want to jump. Oh, along. okay. Sorry, I missed that. No, okay. Go ahead, Vaughn. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks for the presentation. I have two questions. First of all, how how much time it takes generally to build the snap potential mm -hmm. for for someone who already experienced, yep. and also uh, about the performances. I mean the. Uh, force computation is the bottleneck in molecular dynamics, but there are other parts to compute, like renaboring time integration, that can take generally 30% of the time. Even if we, let's say, boost the force computation by a factor of 10, I don't see uh, how, even in that case, the other part will, will, st will stop the, the simulation, right? Well, so I can answer the second part first. Um, so that 30% number you cited, that, that, that sounds pretty uh, high, um, even for a cheap potential like EAM, uh, but it, it depends on the details. Um, so so but time integration and um, renaboring and so on are, are you know, so for, for something like EAM, which is a cheap potential, yeah, they are some fraction, 10%, 20%, whatever. Um, but as I mentioned, these, these, these machine learning potentials are, are quite a bit more expensive. So 10, 100 times more expensive. And so because of that, um, these, these other operations you mentioned become even less important. Um, and they're not, they are not the bottleneck. Um, so the first part of the question, how long does it take to train? Um, um, the, the first, so there's a few answers to that question. One is, uh, how long does it take to generate an initial training data set for some um, application? Uh, that involves running a whole lot, setting up and running a whole lot of DFT calculations, say a thousand of them. If you know what you're doing, like if, you've, if you know how to use DFT and so on, uh, and I've done high throughput stuff before, then you could, uh, you could probably turn that around in a couple of weeks. Um, the, however, uh, and, and then once, once you've done that, then you could maybe in another couple of weeks, you have a trained potential. Um, however, so that would suggest one month. Um, a more realistic response right now might be, uh, and I, I know this empirically from working with outside groups who have just kind of started from scratch, uh, a better number might be one year. Um, and the reason for that large increase uh, from one month to one year is that you have to iterate on this process. Um, because as soon as you're doing an interesting science application, you, there's all kinds of surprises and things that you didn't think about before. Um, and so really, um, you're going to repeat that one month uh, over and over again a few times, uh, learning some interesting science stuff about what really matters in the simulation and so on. But after about a year, I think you should have a pretty good potential. And you've also will have learned a lot about your science application. Thank you. You know, I think we have time for your last question from Alan. So, so I think part of my question might already have been answered in the one month and one year answer that yeah. you just gave. I was mm -hmm. going to ask about the, the software engineering issues and, and you know, black boxes versus white boxes, right? So a black box, you don't have to know what's inside. And the white box is for somebody who wants to tinker and, and you know, change the things underneath, um, but still have an easy experience. Yeah. So, so uh, uh, but when one hears one month to one year, I mean, that that's, requires a real commitment, right? That means that somebody has to really want to do this sort of thing. Could you mm -hmm. imagine a universe where, I mean, where, where the software could be a lot easier? I mean, even if it's not the current universe we live in? Or is it is it the complexity of the problem such that one can't even imagine an easier universe? Um, I can imagine that universe. And I think it's, I think we're about five years away. 
Um, and I think the key is not so much just software engineering. <laughs> it's the, um, it's the uh, this thing I mentioned earlier, robustness. So um, knowing when the model is failing uh, and then knowing how to fix it. So the, the key word there is no. So the, the person using the black box never knows, right? Um, and so, the, so these, there have to be algorithms and workflows that, that know this for the user. Um, and I think UQ, data science, um, active learning are the keys to making that work. And, um, you know, we've, we've started a, a big new project with Habib, Kat, Habib Najim and Kachik Sargsyan. And I, I have high hopes that um, they're going to boost our um, robustness. And I see a lot of other groups around the world uh, doing similar things. Um, so we want to get to the point in five years where instead of only experts being able to do this, any fool can do it, um, which is, of course, creates a whole new set of problems. But um, that's certainly the case with LAMPs as, as well right now. And um, I think the benefits outweigh the, the problems. When you can put the hands, put, put this stuff in the hands of non-experts, I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to create all kinds of benefits. Good luck. Thanks. Thank you. I think that would be a wonderful thing to have. Yep. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, just, I think we're out of time for questions. Um, but let's thank Aiden again for a really nice talk. And um, in response to a question that was posed earlier, this talk is being recorded um, with Aiden's permission. So if you're interested, um, yep. uh, Kate will post the recording to our YouTube channel. I, I look forward to sharing that with my kids. Yes. <laughs> Great. Thanks again. Uh, thanks, everybody. It was a pleasure.